Felix Fischer's first book dealt most what all the chapters were about were war aims, not the beginning of the war. It was a chapter he wrote reluctantly with lots of help and that wasn't his main part of the book. So I'm talk, going to talk a little bit about war aims again from early on and we tried to find out whether there were any war aims before the outbreak of the war. Because whether then we could establish any causal links between war aims and intention to war. And I won't give you a definite answer, but I will show you what I think is possible. So the interesting thing is that the, <coughs> the underpinning uh, of war aims was a widespread belief in Germany that the Reich fought a defensive war against a world of enemies. The expected eventual victory was seen as a justification for imposing German power as a dominating factor in Ger European politics. The redrawn <coughs> European map was to reflect German ambitions. The subsequent lengthy and controversial public debate about Fischer's book focused on three areas. First of all, the German causes for the Europe-wide conflict attracted most of the attention. Secondly, the domestic politics of the war were widely discussed, but failed to figure as prominently. And thirdly, the aspect of continuity between First and Second World War stoked the heat of the public debate. One particular aspect of Fischer's concentrated work is the so-called September program of 9th September 1914, in which the German Chancellor, Bethmann Hollrich, formulated its first catalogue of German war aims. The program was drawn up at the peak of the Battle of the Marne, when Germany in victory was anticipated but didn't materialize. Practically, Germany, I would argue, lost the war because it didn't win the Battle of the Marne. The September program was a result of several discussions. Members of the government had among themselves and with important politicians and leading members of the business world, so far underestimated in the debate. The circle of those involved in these discussions was rather large and indicated the willingness of the government to listen to various proposals. As a result of these deliberations, it should be possible to ask whether the proposals reflect some German pre-war ambitions and policies. So I would like to reopen this debate again. Although there is no pre-war September program, there are a number of pre-war plans which Germany wanted to realize. In addition, a number of themes immediately after the outbreak of the war in early August need to be taken into account as well. So these aims and considerations were dependent on victorious military actions against France and Russia before the two powers had become militarily so strong that Germany had little chance of defeating them. Thus, the war was regarded as a means to an offensive end, and not just purely as a defensive action, as the official policy would have it. And in the German mind, Germany fought a defensive war in the First World War when troops were in Belgium, in Russia, in Italy, in, southern, in, in, Western, in Eastern France, etc. <coughs> but the same attitude you will find in Germany in the Second World War, when Germans, even when they were in Stalingrad or on the Atlantic coast in, in Western France, thought they're fighting a defensive war. The next aim was to achieve military victory as soon as possible. Anticipating victory aims for the expected peace negotiations had to be worked out. The general staff had to plan for military victory, but there was no equivalent among the civilian departments, especially designated for working out peace conditions, till later the Home Office was involved. But the discussion in the public revealed a consensus aiming at expanding Germany's power by peaceful means, and that did not yield enough ultimately by war. The direction of these aims was in Eastern Europe and overseas. The width of these deliberations in the public are reflecting in talks members of the government had with private citizens. One such an account 
is well known, is Walter Rathenau's conversation with the German Chancellor in the summer of 1912, in which the industrialists suggested political goals, the establishment of a customs union for Central Europe, the creation of a German-dominated Middle Africa, <coughs> and a strengthening of Germany's influence in the Middle East. All three expansionist goals appear again later in the war aims program in September in modified form. Among the non-government organizations, it was a pan-German league, a radical group on the <coughs> extreme right, which drafted a war aims program in July 1914 because it believed the, in the inevitability of the war, that is, on the 17th of July. It suggested settlement schemes for German farmers in Eastern Europe um, as colonizers and protectors of the forthcoming extended German boundaries. The fact that similar official war aims were drawn up later in the first euphoric phase of the war indicated that the thinking of the pan-German leadership was not so different from other unofficial but also official circles. In early August, the German government advocated the creation of semi-independent states in Western Russia in order to push the Tsarist state further eastwards and gain more space for German economic and military aspirations as well as settlements. Yet one of these most important volumes, which was discussed in military circles, was to establish Germany as a preeminent military power. The military had thought that this position which Germany had gained after the victory over France in 1871 was going to be lost. And so therefore, if you can re-establish that military predominance, then everything would follow from that. A military predominance was for the military much more important than for the politicians, because the military feared that the allies might become too strong and therefore German military predominance would not be guaranteed. So it was really an attempt to say, we need really Germany to be back in the position of 1871 and late 70s, and for that reason we need to fight a war. Now, the military had asked for this in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. So each time the military had asked that such a war would be conducted. But it was again in 1914 that they pressed for it. Now, a lot of people have made this case about Russian armaments being too strong for Germany to crush Russia as well as France by 1917. The interesting thing about this is that on the Russian side, there's no indication that Russia discussed a delay of its war actions and mobilization till 1917 in order to attack with the supremacy Germany and Austria. That's not the case. So I'm much more of the opinion that Moltke and Bethmann Hollrich <coughs> used the Russian threat as a construct to get people behind their expensive war aims and to have a war earlier than was perhaps uh, wished for by other people. So it was felt that Germany's safety demanded reassertion of its hegemonial position. German society felt superior to France economically, militarily, and psychologically. Nevertheless, it was felt that the French Entente with Britain and the Franco-Russian alliance had strengthened the French position so that the conflict looked even more unavoidable in the late 19th, than in the late 19th century. As one would expect, the German general staff in Berlin repeatedly referred to the need for war to guarantee national security, not an unknown argument among the Americans, even with the Iraq war. After the military bills of 1912 and 13, the general staff was convinced that the moment for a victorious war looked good, a situation which was not guaranteed with certainty in later <coughs> years. This was not a defense argument, as I've pointed out, because if German victory was going to be established sooner rather than later, then this, the German predominance would follow. The rationale behind the push for war was not used to win over the public. The threat to military superiority as a reason for war, as a military argument, which had been used in all international crises. All the arguments for army increases suggest that Germany could be put on the defensive if it did not increase its military strength and size, seize the earliest opportunity for an aggressive campaign in the West. The belief in the superiority of the German armed forces were based on the belief that the army was better. 
was better organized, better trained, better equipped, and had a greater speed of mobilization than the Russian and French armies. For that reason, you didn't need to prepare all this all that much. Most of the work of the general staff was working out timetables. I've seen general staff timetables <coughs> which went through Berlin in a sophisticated way and top secret documents at night time, trains moving from one station to another. And at one stage, it was visited by the chief of staff, the war minister, and the local supreme <coughs> commander to see a little bypass by the railway to be constructed. But this couldn't be done public because this was secret and would not be discussed by the Reichstag. So the military worked really on detailed plans for speedy mobilization. And if you look at the mobilization of Germany, it was quite a feat of technology in 1914 to do it as quickly as that. The argument used to come back by Moltke and Bethmann that by 1917 Germany would have lost its advantageous position because of rising military strength um, and therefore it needed to assert its continental hegemony. The reference to 1917 uh, looks like a construct because nobody knew what the international situation would be like in that year, a point which was even made by the German ambassador in London. So far, no sources have been mentioned on the Russian side that its policies in 1914 should be more cautious because by 1917, its military strength would have grown massively. This is, of course, an argument which Lieven and Schimmelfennig uh, can use. And for Schimmelfennig, it was quite clear in his latest piece uh, of an article that the Russian side was worried about Germany's he hegemonial position. In any case, the German military and political leaders were determined to exploit the favorable opportunities the July crisis offered to launch either victorious war or, and I quote here, if the war does not come, we will still have the prospect of maneuvering the Entente apart, which is not a defensive aim. That's mentioned in the Ritzler diaries. Thus, the preservation of the international status quo was not this to satisfy the German political leadership. One of the early war aims was discussed in Berlin when the special Austrian envoy, Count Hoyos, came to Berlin. The Austrian ambassador handed a letter of the Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph to William II in which he appealed to the German Kaiser to help Austria to reduce and isolate Serbia and eliminate her force with as a political power factor in the Balkans a reconciliation with Serbia was no longer possible. And if a war against Serbia was regarded necessary, then William would regret it if the present favorable conditions were not used by Austria. So that's the first one we have before the outbreak of the war. A later example of early German aims can be found in the Kaiser's outburst against Britain on 30th of July, before the war breaks out. In it, Wilhelm fulminated against Britain's position and believed that all our consuls in Turkey and India, agents and other people should revolutionize the entire Muslim world to fierce rebellion against this hated, lying, conscienceless nation of shopkeepers. For if we are bled to death, England, England should at, lose, at least lose India. A day earlier, Bethmann Holwig met the British ambassador and was able to state that provided that Belgium did not take sides <coughs> against Germany, her integrity would be respected after the conclusion of the war. In the British office, foreign office, it was noted that Germany practically admits the intention to violate Belgian neutrality. It's amazing that it was done that early. The Chancellor also added that provided Britain stayed neutral, Germany aimed at no territorial acquisitions at the expense of France. But it would not be possible for him to give such assurance about the French colonies. So what Germany wanted was not only the Belgian Congo, but quite a chunk of the French colonies. <coughs> Bethmann's thoughts were then contingent on British neutrality. If that was not forthcoming, Germany's aims would probably be less moderate. Mm -hmm. In the East, certain initiatives predate the outbreak of hostilities. On 31st of July, William II gave Graf Hutten-Chapsky the formal assurance that in the case of German victory, the war wasn't decided yet then, the Polish state would be in, recreated at the expense of Russia. This plan was part of the intention 
to pushing Russia further eastwards, a Western idea even with the Ukraine crisis, ensuring Germany's economic preponderance in Russia and creating some buffer states on Russia's Western boundaries. A few days later, Bethmann Holwig instructed the German envoy, envoy in Stockholm to offer any insurgent Finnish groups against Russian rule the prospect of creating an independent Finland. Similarly, the German Foreign Secretary informed the German ambassador in Vienna that the creation of buffer states between the central powers and Russia would be desirable. One of the German aims was to separate Ukraine from Russia. This intention was part of the German planning well before the Russian defeat in East Prussia at the end of August and has been the name of Germany in the First and Second World War. Kurt Rietzler, the Chancellor's assistant, whose diaries were published after Fischer's book were published originally, also referred in his diaries to plans in the East, but more specifically to Austrianist intentions to annex the whole of Poland. Rietzler regretted that nothing had been elaborated before Germany's support for Austria had been offered by Germany, so it shows that the consultation wasn't very close. For military reasons, the German military had argued for the proclamation of an independent Polish state, but had not taken the Austrian position into account. The Germans wanted an independent Polish state in order to raise a Polish army on the German side. But whatever was to be done, the two central powers had still to work out how to deal with Poland. But one point was clear. Germany's policymakers were unwilling to accept a solution which would mainly satisfy Austrian interests. Later, the fate of Poland was discussed again. But German aims in the East were not as <coughs> specific as in the September program, which concentrated on aims in the West, where the main battle raged. And it's very interesting, if you think of that, um, that, that the East was not, at that time, very prominent in German war aims discussion. It was still thought by German conservatives that a, peace could, a separate peace could be worked out with Russia early enough. And secondly, that there was really no conflict of interest between Russia and Germany. The conflict was mainly with France militarily and then also with, British world, with Britain worldwide. And it's interesting that, um, <coughs> that the point about Eastern Europe is sort of on the, right, on the side. But Bethmann Holwig had early on, in early August, already dreamt of Riga and Odessa becoming German, but he later abandoned that again. So we have, despite the fact that the September program is the first program and written down, it doesn't include a very active side on the eastern side. So something about Poland need to be done, but that was really all. There is, of course, one important source which I value very highly. That's uh, a military a Navy attaché uh, writing to Tirpitz, the German Secretary of the Navy, in August, early August 1914, and discusses three war aims. Central Africa, Central Europe, and Eastern expansion. And it's interesting that this letter is written by a military <coughs> official and shows that in Germany the discussion reached quite different channels of the government. It wasn't only the Chancellor and the Foreign Secretary. There were all sorts of people who made submissions to um, the government on what Germany ought to achieve in terms of victory from the Allies. The colonial aims are the easiest one to agree because from the Pan-Germans onwards, from Vietnam Holwig, from Rathenau, <coughs> Central Congo, and the French colonies should become really German. And that's of course, has something to do with the German colonial empire, which had bits in Africa, but wasn't linked up in any way. Uh, Max Weber thought this was most regrettable, but even Max Weber advocated German colonial aims in the First World War. The German Middle Africa. Uh, and that was the war aims program by the German colonial secretary with all the colonial groups supporting this. Then comes the second topic, Mittel Europa. 
Now, this is, of course, in the argument of Neil Ferguson predating the European Union, but it wasn't like that at all. Uh, Middle Europa meant German domination of the border states over Belgium, the Scandinavian countries, Holland, Switzerland, Italy, uh, and then a particular solution had to be found about France once it was defeated. But as Ritzler put it forward, and I think that's quite interesting, this is the most civilized task Germany could undertake. Europe has only a chance to survive if it created a central European association of states based on economic cooperation. That they later couldn't agree what the cooperation should look, should look like is another matter. And Austria was very nervous not to be dominated by Germany industrially. So Rietzler himself advocated the creation of vassal states around Germany, whereas the Foreign Secretary was in favor of partitioning Belgium. Interesting point again. According to Bethmann, the Kaiser also preferred to annex Belgium. The Kaiser advocated the idea of annexing some territory in the West to throw the incumbent population out, ethnic cleansing, and resettled it with deserving NCOs and soldiers. These military colonies were to protect Germany's newly extended boundaries. In the light of the differing demands, the Chancellor no longer believed he was able to keep Belgium intact. Instead, he preferred them to divide it between France, Holland, and Germany. So we have got a whole range of solutions about Belgium to divide it, to annex it, to have a German corridor to the coast, uh, but all things are possible and was not quite clear what will work out in the end. The funniest thing to me was that even the King of Bavaria came to the German headquarters uh, to announce Bavaria's annexa annexationist wishes, which included the Alsace, Belgium, and the Dutch Rhenish estuary. There was not a war with Holland at all. This shows how far the discussion of war aims has affected various groups and politicians. It had become a political theme, whether more modest or unrealistically expensive. At the time, Bethmann elaborated his World September program. He seemed to have integrated the various proposals made to him and gave the final version which Rietzler drafted in his own coloring. The creation of a German-dominated Middle Europa, Middle Africa, and territorial acquisitions in the East. He sent the memorandum to his deputy in Berlin, Delbrück, and reminded him that they had discussed Central European Association shortly after the outbreak of the war in early August. The general objective was to establish, and I quote Bittmann's point, security for the German Empire in the East and the West for the foreseeable future. And here we have a defensive aim, which sounds defensive, but isn't really defensive at all. And that security is the argument, which is intellectually very clever of Bethmann Horvitz to develop that, because that appeals to Germans that they're defining a defensive war to establish German security in the East and the West. He called it Sicherung. Even in a speech in the Reichstag in December 1915, he wasn't very specific, but the, the moment he mentioned the word that Germany is fighting for Sicherung, the right applauded him, uh, the conservatives and the national liberals. After that speech, the editor of the Berlin Tageblatt, who was a non-annexationist, took Bethmann Holwig to task, <coughs> saying that he has changed the camp and become an annexationist. So Bethmann and Wolf, the editor, met. And it's interesting, one of the most interesting statements about Bethmann's policies, uh, which has only been published a few years ago when the Wolf Tagebücher or diaries were published for the first time. And it shows how Bethmann weaved his arguments around not to alienate people, to be properly understood on the right, but also acceptable uh, to, by the liberals or the left. So that was his famous talk of Sicherung. But in the September program, the next few sentences make it clear that war was at stake. Accordingly, France was to be reduced as a great power, and Russia should be thrust eastwards and its powers over the non-Russian people, presumably the Ukraine, Poland, and the Baltic provinces, be broken, but probably not the Russian domination in Central Asia. The Chancellor wanted to leave the final decisions to the military. 
such as the acquisition of Belfort, the western slopes of the Vosges Mountains, and the coastal strip from Dunkirk to Boulogne. But it's not clear whether military circles had made these demands directly. It looks as if these suggestions came from the governor of Alsace Lorraine. We can now trace down, source position is quite good, who made what suggestion. So I come to the end. I would like to say that it's very interesting that quite a lot of early war aims programs, and the interesting thing is that Moltke, Ludendorff, and Hindenburg made <coughs> relatively modest claims, but changed them later during the war, later during the war, which is important. Um, so we can say it is the topic for the German political elite to think how Germany would dominate Europe in the case of victory. And it's interesting, final remarks, interesting that that was the First World War was won by Germany in 1940. The German war aims which Germany had thought of in the First World War were all realized in the Second World War. France was subjugated, Holland and Belgium were next, and Poland destroyed, and the expansion on the Balkans started in 1941. So all these aims which were discussed in the First World War were practically run, run through very quickly as German aims in the Second World War and actually achieved. So that one can say that Germany won the, Second World, the First World War in 1940. That it lost it later again is another matter on another side. But that's quite interesting of if one talks of continuity between the First and the Second World War. The, the Kaiser in 1905 said the future powers of the world as United States, Great Britain, and Russia. And Germany is too small to be one of the world powers. We have to let yeah, our yeah. base grow so that Germany could become the fourth of the world powers of the future. And the way to do it at that time was thought through war and military means. And the interesting thing is that German industrialists, there were already some who thought this was to totally unnecessary. Rathenau and Stinnes both believed that Germany would become an empire through economic means and doesn't need a war. But Germany was set up by military people and the military couldn't think about anything else about territory and wars and conquest. A completely different from indirect rule through econo economists. But the fact that the two said it means that the climate in Germany was for military means rather than for economic ones. Thank you.